Thank you. Uh, um, so first of all, I have, of course, to say that I'm delighted to be back in Luxembourg. I was here 10 years ago, uh, and uh, uh, you have improved some, you know, during those uh, 10 years. Uh, secondly, uh, I want you to understand who I am, in addition to Blanche's fabulous introduction. Uh, I am a sad old man from another stinking rich, tiny, inconsequential nation on the surface of the earth, namely Norway. So we have the advantage of being so similar to you as it is possible to be, except that luckily we are 10 times as big. So we are 5 million people who live very well, we are nearly as rich as you are. We are the second in the league of the world's nations. We live from one very negative, very lucrative activity, namely we produce most of the oil and gas for Europe, which makes us stinking rich. And you are handling the money of most of the world, <laughs> making you stinking rich. This is as unacceptable as our production of oil and gas, they're very equivalent in many ways. You know, things that are absolutely necessary, very helpful, and at the same time, in our long-term view, not the type of sustainable activity that should maintain the well-being uh, of people. So that's uh, the starting point. Uh, as you will notice, I speak wonderful English. I speak the most typical Norwegian English that you will ever hear. So when someone speaks English my way, you can immediately tell this is a person from Oslo West. We speak English like this and we will continue to do so. Uh, I have learned, and so I'm, since you laugh, I have gotten to the point, I always need to start by talking about a number of unimportant things in order for you to get used to the sing song so you understand what I'm saying. In the old days I always told a joke initially and no one laughed <laughs> and it took me some decades before I understood this is because of the sing song. It's not because of the bad jokes but I do not give jokes. Speaking internationally you should never tell a joke because jokes depend on culture and does not, do not communicate well. Uh, anything else? Yes, one more thing. I'm going to show a number of slides. Those of you who like slides, who like graphs, numbers, curves, you would love my slides. So if there are any engineers here, you really should look at my slides. For all the rest of you, which is the vast majority, this looks like spaghetti. It doesn't <laughs> communicate anything. And the only reason why I always show them is I don't speak about them. I just show them in the background is because they make one point. There is a huge amount of very heavy thinking and report making, model building, thinking, economic analysis behind my simple words. I am not as stupid as most people think I am. You know, uh, and when I speak simply and imprecisely, it is in order to communicate, which is much more important than to be very precise. And so I show you these things in the background to show that if you try afterwards to, you know, it's easy to kick me down. It is not. You know, I know much more about this than any of you. You know? <laughs> and, and this I can say for sure, because none of you have spent 50 years, day and night, talking, studying these issues. That's one of the real wonders about becoming 77 and being better than most. <laughs> this is very nice to get applause at the beginning. 
<laughs> you know, uh, 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 please repeat afterwards. <laughs> so, jokes to side, apparently you know, understand what I'm saying. We can start. So it is important to press the right thing. So, 50 years ago, my friends and I wrote and published a book called The Limits to Growth. This was a tiny book that contained 12 scenarios for world development from uh, the year 1970 to the year 2100, 130 years into the future. Six of the scenarios in the Limits to Growth book were sad scenarios where something went wrong in the 21st century. Either the world ran out of resources, or there was too much pollution, or there was too little food, or there was too little land, or there was mismanagement of some type. But largely, in the sad scenarios, the world was too little. It was limits on resources, limits on pollution absorption capacity that created collapses in, in the system. No. So this is, OK? Six of the scenarios were positive scenarios where humanity managed to achieve some degree of sustainability in the 21st century, where they stopped the material expansion of the population, the material use of resources measured in tons per year, handled the emissions of society so that it was reduced below the pollution absorption capacity of the system, and one reached some degree of, of sustainability in the system. In 1972, when we published this book, we did not know, and science did not know, enough to tell which of these 12 scenarios was going to be the most likely. You know, which one was humanity going to choose? All we could say at the time is that humanity, please keep away from the overshoot and collapse scenarios, the sad scenarios, and please try to work you know, towards some degree of sustainability, some degree of trying to keep within the boundary of the planet. This was the simple message. We thought that once we published the book, the world will nod and say this is obviously correct that when we live on a small, light blue uh, golf ball hanging in big space, you know, clearly we cannot be an endless number of people, and clearly we cannot have an endless number of coal mines, and clearly we cannot run, etc., etc., etc. So we are now 50 years after, uh, and we are able to say, so what did the world do? So we presented the warning. It was a totally trivial and totally obvious uh, warning. And what happened? Well, we know uh, that nothing happened. The world has continued its expansion. Uh, these graphs show in black lines what has actually happened compared to four of the scenarios in the book. So the population has continued growing exactly as forecast in most of the central scenarios of the limits to growth. Uh, the GDP, that is the industrial output per person, the physical production per person, has continued to grow, just as we said. Uh, the fossil reserves, the amount of oil, coal, oil, and gas remaining in the planet has gone down. They have, of course, not disappeared. Neither did we believe that they would disappear, you know, by now. Uh, emissions are rising, uh, uh, like in, in, in uh, 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 limits. And then, more interesting, well-being is starting, it has continued to increase the average well-being of people, which is not the GDP, but it is a broader composite of things that influence people's happiness. 
is growing, but interestingly, this is the one curve where you see actual developments, the black line starting to level off. You know, the steady rise in the human development index over the last 50 years has started to, to level off, just like it did uh, in most of the limits to growth scenarios at this point in time. So the interesting thing is that scientifically speaking, finally after 50 years after <laughs> limits to growth, we can say that limits to growth was right in the sense that we, the world has chosen to follow you know, the basic scenarios of limits to growth during this uh, period. And in other words, what it means is that physical growth did continue and we have overshot the carrying capacity of the planet, so we have allowed the system to expand into a situation where it is unsustainable. And from here, we need in some way or the other, if we want to have a sustainable society, to get the human footprint. That means either the number of people or the footprint per person down into sustainable uh, levels. The interesting thing that we also have learned over the last 50 years is that it, it turned out that it was not resources that was the limiting factor. It was not agricultural land. It is not you know, the availability of biodiversity. The real problem is scenario number two from 1972. This is what's called the pollution scenario. And the real pollutant that is actually now threatening in the shortest term to reduce well-being of human beings is climate gas emissions. It's greenhouse gas emissions that when accumulating in the atmosphere, you know, increases the temperature, which then of course has a lot of consequences on, on the well-being of nature and ourselves. So we are, in my mind, in our minds, in the, the Earth for All project, racing into scenario number two, pollution crisis. So that's what's going on. So the actual development has told us that it was scenario number two that was the, the closest one to what actually did happen. And let me say this in great detail in case there is someone yet who do not understand what we are doing. So for the time being, humanity is emitting every year twice as much CO2 as is being absorbed during that year in the world's oceans and the world's forests in biomass. So this one half is absorbed and taken out of the system. The other half remains in the atmosphere with a very long half-life. And as we're doing this, you know, every year, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere goes up. And it is a scientific fact that when you have more CO2 in the atmosphere, it works as a pillow or a duve or a blanket. You know, so it accumulates heat, solar heat, under itself. And the higher the concentration, the warmer it gets. And it, this will continue, and it will continue not only until we stop all use of coal, oil, and gas, and stop emissions of CO2. Because at that point in time, the concentration is high, and the temperature is high. And it will remain high even if we stop emitting the CO2. So after we have cut emissions to zero, we will have to pump out, suck out of the atmosphere all the excess CO2 that we put into the atmosphere during 150 years of industrialization or the last 100 years of so large-scale power generation and, and uh, fossil fuel use. So there is and that task of getting rid of the CO2 afterwards is 
the equivalent of 10,000 huge carbon capture and storage machines running for 100 years. So that is what we have done. The damage that we have done this far, if we want to undo it, it is essentially the same effort as what we did in the past. We built 10,000 large coal-fired utilities and gas-fired utilities, and we ran them for 100 years and got enough CO2 into the atmosphere so that we now have to take it out. So this dream of many people that we solve the problem by cutting greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2050. It's total bullshit. And the only reason why serious scientists like I and others actually avoid saying this is that it is so depressing for people to know that not only do we have to cut all use of coal, oil and gas to zero, we even have to then start on the huge job of getting rid of, or suck out of the atmosphere the remaining CO2. So that's the story. So you can ask the question, what the hell should we do about this? Uh, and uh, that was, of course, uh, at the 50-year anniversary of, of uh, sorry, I forgot to press the button. This is, <laughs> these are the emissions of CO2 per year. And as you can see, 50 years ago, I started talking about these matters. And you can see on the slope of that curve how unimportant the impact of the limits to growth has been. You can see absolutely no reduction in the rate of growth of annual emissions of CO2. So here we have been speaking, talking, creating the IPCC, passing national resolutions, adopting the sustainable development goals. And the only thing that has not happened is that global emissions of CO2 has even buckled. Yes, if you look at the lower curves, the EU and the US have been capable of at least decoupling to some extent so that their annual emissions at least do not go up as much as that of the other 80% of the world population who desperately need economic development and more energy in order to solve their well-being. So there is some progress, but it is much too slow. And that's the only thing I want you to learn from history. We told 50 years ago what is needed to do. We told how to do it. And now we have spent 50 years trying to not do it. Except a little bit. Sadly, so the Earth for All project was started two or three years before the 50-year anniversary of the limits to growth in order to be able to present an update of the model-based study made 50 years ago. So we made a new model and we made a new study. And the sad fact was that we then discovered that we do not only have one problem, we actually have five problems. Uh, and I hope no, my slides are. So that is the study. So let me just, okay. So the, the Earth for All looks like this. And it's a bestseller in Germany. It is now luckily out in Italy and Sweden and China and all over the place. So it, it is actually starting to, to work. You should go to the website, earthforall.life, uh, at the bottom, which shows the huge campaign which is now being run in order to try to make people act. But the important thing is that there was no way around accepting the fact that we do not only have one problem on planet Earth in 2022, we have five problems. And these five are depending on where you live in the world. You know, these other problems 
some of depending on where you were, live, each the, the combination of problems that is most serious for you varies. So we in the Western industrialized world, for us climate is the real, the real, real uh, bottleneck. Perhaps inequality, the rising inequality is also starting to erode, you know, the cohesion of, of our Western democracies. Uh, so these two, but if you look at the world as a whole, the major problem is of course still enduring poverty. There are billions and billions of people that are shit poor and who need old-fashioned economic development in order to increase labor productivity in their societies in such a manner that they can actually feed themselves, house themselves, have good educational systems and security. And there is no way around rapid economic development in order to solve extreme poverty. So that's one of the things that we are strongly in favor of. The second problem that is, as I said, really serious is rising inequality, particularly in the United States of America, but also in most other capitalist market-driven uh, economies. You see this side effect of capitalism that wealth and income concentrates on ever fewer uh, people. Disempowerment of women is an incredibly important part of the problem because empowering women leads to one result which is an absolute necessity, namely smaller family sizes. So by doing what we did recommend 50 years ago, which is to provide education, health, contraception and opportunity to the world's women, we will achieve lower family sizes and we have. And so in reality, uh, that problem has been solved, but it is important to pursue it so that we do get to the full equal rights for, for the women. Biodiversity decline is of course something that bothers Blanche uh, and me as a deputy director general of WWF International for five years. I spent five years of my life trying to protect nature. This is not going well. You know, we are still cutting down the biodiverse parts of the world. The, the old growth forests and the coral reefs have essentially been bleached already. And so we're losing this one. And then, of course, climate change, as you all know, and as I started talking about. So the problem is that we have five intertwined problems that are not solvable, separate of each other. You need to find a solution to all. So that was the first conclusion from the 50-year study, that the problem has actually gotten more complicated than it was before. The second uh, conclusion uh, was, so we asked the question, uh, what is going to happen if we don't do anything? And the second conclusion is that if we continue business as usual, and what does business as usual mean in our sense? It means that if we continue to make decisions in society at the individual level, at the corporate level, at the national level, <laughs> and at the global level, global decisions are never made, and that will continue, if we continue decision-making as practice during the last 40 years, the Earth for All model says that we are in for a very sad next the end of this century. And the main problem is that human well-being is going to decline during this period, which is, and what is human well-being? And let me just do that first. So instead of saying that the goal of society is to increase the GDP, you know, to increase the income of the nation so that the income per person increases, we're saying that the goal of society ought to be 
to increase well-being, the average well-being of the ordinary working man and woman, you know, the 90% of the population. We do not care so much about me and my rich friends. You know, we can be sacrificed in this picture the way uh, we see it. And then it comes the question, what is it that constitutes the well-being of an ordinary human being? And we have chosen to use the well-being definition of the well-being alliance of nations. This is a global organization that is trying to organize those forces in the world, that is trying to work not to maximize GDP, but to maximize the well-being of the working man and woman. Five components. The first one is income after tax. The second one is how much public services are available per person per year. The third one is how equal is the society? What is the difference in income and wealth between the richest 10% and the lower 40%? Uh, environmental quality, you know, how, in what kind of physical surroundings do we live? And then finally, and very important, is the very soft variable of perceived progress. And this is basically something you measure by asking in the population, do you think we are on the right way? You know, and so the higher proportion, proportion of the society that actually answers in a poll that yes, I think we are on the right way, you know, the better. And we think that that's a very important part of the total well-being uh, of the ordinary human being. Uh, in China, we have done fabulous statistical uh, efforts. We once made a 109 question questionnaire asked of 20,000 Chinese all over China. And this latter thing, that was not done by the Club of Rome, this was done by Norwegian Development Aid you know, at some earlier time. So we asked the question of the child, on a scale from zero to 10, you know, how happy are you? How satisfied are you with life? And they would ask, answer one number, and we know from international uh, comparisons that if you ask this in, in, in the United States, people answer seven. If you ask in France, they answer eight. If you ask in Finland, they answer six. You know, there are cultural differences that indicate, you know, determine what you, I don't know what happens in Luxembourg, whether you are morose people or whether you're Mexican, Latin Americans, you know, that give up. But then we ask the next question, which is much more interesting. So when you say seven today, how does that compare with five years ago? You know, are you better off now than five years ago? And then you ask the next question. How do you think this is going to be in five years? And then you take the proportion of the questionnaires, which answers better, better, that both think that today is better than five years ago. And then you talk about, uh, and also think that the future will be better than it is today. And then you count. In our representative, and that was a truly representative study we did because we sorted it. So in, in China, and this was in 2016, 75% of the population believes that China is on the right track. So when you ask the 1.3 billion Chinese what they think about what's going on, 75%. I then made an investigation in Norway, so I paid Gallup Norway to ask exactly the same question in Norway. You know, stinking rich. You know, wonderful government, no corruption, no nothing. I mean, everything is fine in Norway. We even have more space than you have. And we have the energy, and, and so our agricultural production is somewhat smaller, but that's the only difference. So, guess. So, what do you think we got in Norway? So, we got 75% Chinese being satisfied. What do you think was the answer in, in Norway? What would you think? What, what would you think if you ask this question of your friends or yourself here? So I'll give you the answer. So 25% of Norwegians think we are on the right track. And when you then 
analyze a little deeper, it is what they basically say is yes. So we have a certain shitty situation at this point in time. It was the same shit five years ago, and it will be the same shit five years in the future. There is no belief that there exists a political party that actually has a radical program that actually is going to change anything. Everyone understands that we are really lost in the Western world. Interesting. This I added for Blanche, who asked me to talk a little bit more about well-being versus GDP. So when GDP goes up, number one typically goes up. You know, income after tax goes up when the GDP goes up. Also, normally, if there are sufficient tax levels in society, when GDP goes up, number two also goes up. Particularly if you have a society which taxes the rich and gives the money to the poor. You know, that's one of the, or to the government, which then supplies free health, free education, and free pensions, etc., unemployment benefits for the money. The other things, GDP does not work. And what we found in our business as usual scenario is that those three things, the latter things over the next 30 to 60 years, are going to overwhelm the improvement in purchasing power and governmental services so that total well-being is going to go down. And that's what, sorry, that's what this graph shows. So this is a picture of what will actually happen from 1980, what has happened from 1980 to 2020, and then what will happen from 2020 to 2100. And let me, again, since we have the time, just show you very roughly what will happen. And this is at the planetary level. So the level of aggregation is humongous. You know, what does a global average of happiness mean? You know, this is like standing, what is the average depth of the ocean? You know, it's, but again, it gives some idea. The world population is going to reach a peak already at roughly nine, nine and a half billion people, only 30 years into the future, the way we see it. And then it will decline down back to essentially the, the six billion that we had before uh, at the beginning of this century. Why? Simply because people luckily are getting educated and they get access to health because as you see the blue line, we think that GDP development, economic development, is going to continue, and this will give the resources necessary in order to run the health and the education and the stuff. And so the reason why the population peaks is that the number of children per woman, that was five when I started talking about these things, three and four-ish, four and a half, you know, which is two and a half at this point in time. We have lived through a fabulous development in, in the, both in the rich world, but particularly in the poor world. And now when we get to 2050, this will be down to roughly one and a half all over the place, just like it is in, in both Norway and Luxembourg at this point in time. So that is very important from a global perspective because the human footprint, which is the real problem, is proportional to the number of people. So if you lower the number of people, that solves a big problem. Uh, the GDP per person, as we see it, is going to continue to rise because there is absolute need for economic development in the poor parts of the world. And it's totally possible to do it, as the Chinese have shown. Eight doubling, you know, the GDP per person for 1.4 billion Chinese in a 40-year period. We have been unable through the World Bank and Western liberal economic policy to get, you know, growth in our former colonies. But that's, of course, because the tool of free trade and liberal markets and capitalistic and market ideas don't work if you really want to build a nation from scratch. This is not accepted by most economists. So I disagree with everyone, and this is among the things that Blanche told you about, that we in the Earth for All 
projects are, of course, in direct conflict with the World Trade Organization and other defenders of the liberal market ideas about maximum competition and free trade. Luckily now, of course, the world is starting to rethink you know, the globalization idea. And so finally, the world is coming after us, in my mind. That's, it, that's the GDP. Then you look at the gray line, which is inequality, which is actually then uh, rising all throughout. You know, the business cycle is the, is the long wave that you, you see on all the curves. That's the 10-year business cycle that peaked in the, the great financial crisis 12 years ago, and which is what we're seeing now. We're just in one of those new crashes that occurs roughly every uh, 10 years. Uh, inequality is rising. Then you look at the global warming curve, the black curve, which shows how the temperature is going to go up. And in, if we just continue decision making as we are currently doing it, uh, our best estimate is that we will pass through plus two degrees centigrade in 2050, and we will you know, be up around two and a half degrees at the at this end of the century. And as a sum of all of this, the green line you show is the well-being of the average earthly citizen increasing somewhat from 1980 to 2000, 2010, and then starting a decline, you know, because of rising inequity, because of worsening of the climate, and because of the social tensions that are rising in the system. The thin line, which, you know, really starts to lift when well-being is going down, because, as you know, when, well, when economic growth goes down, unemployment starts to rise and people start to get irritated. It's the same type of mechanism in the system here. So why did I spend all this time trying to be morose and pessimistic, and etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? It's in order to rub it in that what we are doing is something but it is not enough. So if you do the calculations, you will see that we are too slow. We are you know, solving problems, but we aren't solving them fast enough. The real new worry in uh, the, uh, the Earth for All report is that one of the horrible things, or one, the good news is that we don't see any climate collapse. You know, we don't see any resource collapse. We don't see food running out. We don't see many of the things that people worry about. We don't see in, in our model analysis. But what we do see is the rising worry of social collapse. Namely, the fact that when, when the well-being of the majority goes down decade after decade, you know, gradually social tensions start to rise in the system. And if this is a badly managed nation with problems anywhere, and then you get a little bit of climate change into the system, you know, then suddenly you get a national breakdown, like Somalia, like Afghanistan, like these nations that have stopped functioning as entities that can actually make and implement complicated decisions about how to improve the well-being of the majority. And so the book basically says that the real problem in the short term, that means over the next 30 years, is the increasing incidence of social collapse. So we have moved basically from the physical thing into the, the, the social thing, which I think is increases the precision level of the limits to growth 50 years ago very much because it basically says that the situation is not one where you open the door one day and then lithium is very expensive or it's dark you know because the climate has actually destroyed the system or all the forests are burning most likely you will open the door one day and there is civil war somewhere you know so you have social collapse very nearby and of course the stories in France, you know, where the government is trying to implement decent policy and is, of course, not capable to do it. 
is an illustration, the United States of America. My wonderful, the place where I'm educated, where I lived, you know, for five years in the wonderful America that existed from 1970 to 75. You know, they're destroying their own ability to make any meaningful, quick decision on complicated matters. And so this is the worry that we need uh, to handle. And this is what I want you to, to think about, uh, that, that most likely, you know, we're facing a very different type of challenge over the next 30 years than you are used to from your grown life where, you know, pollution problems, etc., was the real thing. You know, we're now facing the possibility of social collapse. Luckily, Luxembourg and Norway will be late in the process. You know, we have more stable systems than, than most others. But, at least in my country, we are very easily seeing the new tensions arising between the new arrivals and, and the old population. You know, so with very different values and very different interests. And Sweden has, of course, not even managed the in, uh, integration of the large uh, immigration policy, uh, population. So they are very close already to being a dysfunctional society, incapable of putting in place strong policy. I would not have spent all of this time boring you or scaring you or whatever if it were not for the fact that there exists a solution. And that's, of course, what most of the Earth for All book is all about. It is how can we manage to avoid the decline in the green line? And the reason why we want to avoid declining well-being is it is the decline in the well-being that triggers the social collapse. So we would like to avoid the social collapse. And uh, the study, uh, so this is a very simplified version of the model. Uh, then, uh, so the, this is the solution. And the solution is totally trivial. You know, all our marketing people say, can't you come up with something which is interesting? You know, you're simply here restating what absolutely any idiot on the surface of the earth knows. That in order to eliminate global poverty, which is the first thing you need to do, since that's the highest problem for most of the people. So you need, we know that classical development aid does not work, you know, so we need economic models. I say we need to copy the Chinese, but most of the people on the project hate China, like most other people, and so they don't accept this as a solution. So we say use Guatemala or Costa Rica. Costa Rica is, uh, or use Norway from 1945 to 1965, when 200 gentlemen in Oslo decided on absolutely anything that was to be done, and we evolved from being a shit poor nation just after the war to being a social democracy, you know, fairly evenly distributed 20 years later. But this was simply because a few gentlemen said that we are going to do this, come hell or high water. It's not important that they were gentlemen because there were also women among them, but the important thing is that a few, a benevolent elite essentially took control and ran the system. Of course, they were ousted after 20 years by democratic right-wing type of or moderates that thought that democracy is more important than progress and uh, that's it and we have no had problems with uh, those ever since in my mind but that here again people disagree we need to reduce inequality that's very 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 simple to do that's just to have progressive taxation where you tax capital and give the money to the people uh, Empower women. We know free education, health, contraception, and opportunity, and I should also include pension you know, for women, is going to do the trick. You know, once you're absolutely certain of all those things, you choose to have as few children as you can, and you spend your life you know, having an interesting career instead of uh, watching the children. Halt biodiversity decline. It's very simple. You need to just, you know, 
to change agricultural practices from the industrial practices that you, Luxembourg, and the rest of the EU and the United States are using, destroying the soil, you know, to regenerative practices that actually, you know, cares for the nature and absorbs CO2 carbon in the process. And then finally, stop climate change. Totally trivial. You know, you just phase out the use of coal, oil, and gas over a 30-year period, reducing the physical amount of coal, oil, and gas that you're using by 3% a year. And then that's end of story. And then, of course, you build sun and wind to produce the electricity, and you use gas with CCS to produce the industrial heat. And all of this is fully doable. So, our communications people say, could you please tell something which is interesting, new, you know, innovative? And the answer is that <laughs> the, uh, since this is what needs to be done, this is the answer. You know, this is what we need to do. Uh, and and uh, simulation runs just in order to so when we feed these things into the system, look at the green line. So we managed to stop the decline in the green line so that this does, using our metric, you know, solve the problem. It leads to a situation where well-being doesn't expand dramatically, but at least it increases so that the social tension in the system actually is much lower. Inequality is improved dramatically here because we do take from the rich and give to the poor. Uh, so, yes, the solution works. So, then comes the next question, and I'm getting close to the end because I see that you're getting bored. Um, uh, 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 so, when the solution both is totally obvious and has been totally obvious for anyone who's has a brain and an observation capacity for the last 30 years. Why is progress so slow? Why doesn't much more happen? And here is the, uh, and the bottom reason is the following. Those five things, they have one thing in common. It means that we need to do a structural shift in the economy. We need to take people and capital from the dirty sectors and shift it to green sectors. To speak easy, we need to take the coal miners and those people who build coal-fired utilities or gas-fired utilities and pipelines and make them build solar panels or windmills or electric transmission lines. We need to take those people that currently produce fossil cars and just shift them over the street to produce electric cars, etc., etc. And it's so that's what the green shift is all about. It is to build down the dirty, polluting activities and to build up the green. This is what the green shift actually means. When you don't speak in economic terms, because economic terms are very, very useless in many ways to try to describe something as simple as what I just said. Because people then start to talk about consumption, about reboot effects, about uh, rebound effects, and, and you know all the things that you should not try to talk about in this context. So this is what we achieved. Then we have been doing the calculations, and luckily many other international institutions have calculated how much, so how many jobs and how much physical infrastructure do we have to move from dirty to clean in order to achieve uh, a better world. And the answer is between 2 and 4% of the total employment and the total capital, which is not very much, you know. So uh, that's all it will take. So if we could take between two and four percent of the employment of, of of Luxembourg and move it from dirty activity to clean activity, this would solve the problem. You would serve as a role model. If we could manage to do the same thing in Norway and you could do it here, we could at least point to the rest of the world and say that this is doable. 
when it is that small, what needs to be done? Because 2% of your workforce, so you are 600,000 people, if I know, that means that your workforce is of the order of 300,000 people. 2% of 300,000 is actually 6,000 people, is what you need to move, you know, in order from the mine or from the coal that you don't have it anymore, but that type of thing, into, you know, something producing windmills or producing solar panels or, or something else like this. So this is piece of, why does it not happen? And here comes the other thing you should remember from this, e the re from this evening. The reason why things are so slow is that what needs to be done is not profitable from the point of view of the investor. The return on investment in these things that people need, the world needs, is not only lower than the return on investment in other activities, it's in many cases negative. So building an electric car is much more expensive than building a fossil car. So if in a purely competitive market you try to do like Elon Musk did do, you know, you won't succeed. You will get higher returns if you stay with Mercedes and BMW, as they chose to do, you know, up till three or four years ago. So the main reason why the world does not solve the problem is that it is not profitable. So it means that the unregulated market cannot solve the problem and will not solve the problem that impact investors and all those people that think that it is possible to find profitable use of capital that will at the same time solve the problem are wrong. Afterwards, I would like you to tell me that I am wrong because it would really help the world that, I, that you could prove me wrong. But my counter-argument is going to be the following. If these things were profitable in the current world, which is totally afloat in money, you know, the income distribution in the world is so skewed that the people who own all the money have so much money that the only thing they're looking for is profitable placements for, for uh, projects for the money. I've been the chairman of three banks, so at least this I also know about what I'm speaking about. And so the proof that these problems remain unsolved is the proof, the fact that they remain unsolved proves that they're not profitable, at least not profitable enough to attract enough capital fast enough to solve the problem. Yes, there is development on the price of win on the price of sun, on the price of batteries, on the price of anything that uh, interested people are interested in. But the point is that even today, you know, the UK government has to promise, you know, a high price in the future in order to get people to invest in offshore wind in, in, in. and finally, even the United States government, which is, of course, as anti-subsidy and anti-state as anyone on the surface of the earth, has now finally you know, made a fabulous decision to invest $800 billion over the next 10 years in greener, you know, in, as a subsidy to American windmills, to American solar panels, to American electric cars, which is a huge step ahead. But the point is, what you should remember, the things that need to be done are not profitable from the investor point of view. What to do? The simple solution is, of course, to subsidize those things. Much like we chose, much like the Germans chose to do, to introduce sun and wind in competition with much more cheap coal, you know, in the year 2000. Much like Norway has chosen now to do, Five years ago, we pay 10 to 20,000 uh, euros to anyone who buys uh, an electric car. And of course, 
in by now, you know, 50% of all the new car purchases in our country are electric, and we have no even banned fossil cars starting 2035, because this is fully possible, but it takes a subsidy of 10 to 20,000 euros per car in order to get this to happen. So we have the problem that nothing happens or little happens because it is not profitable and we have the potential solution simply to subsidize those things. Subsidies must be paid, however. And so where should the government get the money to pay the subsidies? And the obvious answer, and we will only take the obvious answer now, then you can ask questions about the other alternatives. The obvious answer is, of course, to tax. So you need to raise taxes. Then how much taxes do you need? You need 2 to 4% of the national income in extra taxes, because that's what it takes in the worst case to move 2 to 4% from uh, dirty to clean. Will the people accept this? No. There is a did I, have I already told the story about in this audience? No, I'm, I'm getting confused. This is the sixth time today. So uh, I was appointed head of the Royal Commission, the Climate Commission of Norway in 2005 to 2006. Uh, and and uh, we were asked to come up with a plan for how Norway could reduce its greenhouse gas emissions during the next 40 years down to insignificant levels. We worked for one and a half years, produced a unanimous report, uh, which said here are the 15 decisions that Parliament needs to pass, and then this will lead to a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from Norwegian territory by 63% by 2050. The bill is increasing income taxes from 33% to 34%. That's what was necessary in order to pay this thing, not very much. I spent four years of my life traveling in Norway trying to sell this great idea to people, namely that we could solve the biggest problem on the surface of the earth, you know, at the cost of a 1% increase in the income tax. And of course, no one wanted this. There are a few percent. And that was it. That's when I, because people said to me, Jorgen, why should I pay, you know, uh, 200 euros per year, which is the 1% tax? Why should I pay 200 euros a year in order to create an uncertain advantage for my children or grandchildren 30 years into the future? That was the typical uh, answer to, to this thing. Which is, so this is the basis on which I say that when we now are proposing to increase taxes by 2 to 4% of GDP, you know, we will not win forth in a democratic society. So our second solution is that we tax the rich. And that's, of course, the line of the Earth for All report. We presented this in Davos two weeks ago. Great fun. You know, along with Oxfam, tax the rich was the uh, baseline, and we got a lot of press. But, of course, no appreciation from the participants in, 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 in Davos. But the idea is the following. The 10% richest There is the 10% richest. So the point is that, that the 10% richest people in the world control 50% of national income. And so we are saying that the 10% richest in society are fully capable of paying 2 to 4% of national income in taxes. It only needs to increase their income tax by 4 to 8 percent, and that's fully doable. And since we live in democratic societies where 90 percent of the population will not be affected by this ta tax, clearly this is going to be adopted by democratic society. We're smart enough and have lived long enough in the United States of America to know that in the US this will never happen. 
you know, the intense hate of the state in, in the United States is so deep and constitutional that there is no way you will ever get them to do such a thing. And also, most Americans say that when I get rich, I'm not going to pay a fucking dollar to that fat ass Washington corrupt, awful political establishment. So it won't work there. And it may not work in England and in Australia, you know, the two other real liberal uh, centers of the world, but Northern Europe. Mm -hmm. Here we think perhaps, you know, this would be a way ahead. And uh, the, uh, so this is our proposal. We will accelerate the green shift by paying subsidies to those things that needs to be done and are unprofitable, and we will take the money from the 10% richest. The money will be earmarked for doing the unprofitable things, so you're not allowed to use this money for all the other things, which also destroys competition with the private sector, so one shouldn't be doing that type of thing. And so, in the end, that's the challenge, the way I see it. It is to try to convince a political majority in intelligent, educated, Western, rich societies to actually support a strong state that actually does those five things that are necessary in order to improve the well-being of the majority. When I talk to my rich friends, you know, so I belong, of course, to that group that should pay this bill. Uh, I say the reason why you should be in favor of this, the reason why the central bank ought to be in favor of this, the reason why the association of industrial industries, I don't know what it's called, but the owner organizations in this country should be in favor of this, is that if we do not do this, the likelihood that the average well-being, that the well-being of the average working Joe and Jane or whatever they're called in English, is going to decline during the next 30 to 60 years, and sooner or later you'll get a revolution in your face. And that revolution is going to cost you very, very much more of your wealth than paying, you know, an extra four to eight percent income tax during the next uh, several uh, years. Whether they listen, <laughs> we will see, you know. So uh, I'm instructed by all my dear friend colleagues that I must not be a doomsayer, I must have a positive attitude, a smiling face, and I must give people hope. And so hereby I have given you the hope. There exists a very, very simple way to solve all the problems that we're facing. Thank you. Thank you for the interesting uh, yeah, conference. Uh, I think now you understand that as why I said that you have certainly different points of view on certain matters, <laughs> uh, and I am glad to uh, hear your questions. You can uh, talk in uh, Luxembourgish or French if you want to, and speak to the microphone because of the introduction. And please, rather short questions, as as we are very much people, no long statements if it possible, and a short question. Could we turn on the? Could you also turn on the light, if that's really possible? Thank you. That's. So, Jordan, I'm happy to say you're wrong when it comes to subsidies. And a lot of proof has been, you sound on subsidies, you sound a lot like the discredited head of uh, EFO, which you're probably familiar with, the Hans Werner Sinn. Um, he, he likes uh, to discredit or try to discredit electric vehicles and renewable energy, and he mentions the subsidies the same way that you do. And Professor Och Hoekstra at the Eindhoven University of Technology um, has been published in Spiegel and elsewhere. 
So it's impossible to understand what you're saying. Either you must, can you speak closer to the microphone no, or not, farther? Not so close. I would say a little farther. bit farther. Can you please start again? Yeah. Because I no, not, not the whole stuff. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Oh. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Shall, I, shall I speak uh, less, less quickly? No, it's okay. You, you, you put too much air, I think. Okay. <laughs> So, Professor Oak Hoekstra has discredited similar arguments about subsidies. He's at Eindhoven University of Technology. You sound too much like Hans Werner Singh at IFO. And for example, the oil business is the most heavily subsidized business in the world. And you don't talk about that. The subsidies, the incentives that have been given to renewable energy have the carpets pulled out from under them. They're the only energy industry to have that happen. Why is that? Jesus Christ. Okay. Jesus, so, so, Jesus Christ. So here, this is a very elegant intervention of yours, like mine is a very elegant intervention of mine. So what you're doing in your intervention, you're now trying to mix a number of facts into something which is very uh, confusing for most people. So let me start with the subsidies to oil and gas that occurs in the world. This is very largely attempts at redistribution of income to those poor people that cannot afford to burn the paraffin in the evening in order to get light. You know, that's where the vast intention of those subsidies are. Yes, you're absolutely right that the rules have been made such that the middle class in Turkey and other places, yes, they do get too much of those subsidies. But those subsidies are not the subsidies that make Shell and Equinor in our country uh, continue to operate and make a lot of money. So that's then when people suggest to take those subsidies away, which is a commonly agreed policy by neoclassical macro people, you know, I disagree because they are disregarding the inequality effect of that subsidy. Yes, they should change the system so that people with an income about 10,000 uh, euros per person per year do not get the subsidy so that it is focused on the poor. So that's that score. Then what was the first score with uh, extra and, and uh, so they say that, uh, so what did you say? No. Because. So the problem is Hanberger's sin was, he was considered the state was distinguished. He was the head economist, chief economist for the EFL. True, but the point is that any classical economist is, of course, absolutely in f against any type of state intervention, intervention yeah. taxes. You know, I, so I went to school in the United States of America in 1970, getting my doctorate in macroeconomics and management. And I was, of course, taught macro 101 the way all of you have been taught macro 101, you know where government is waste. This is the G that you're at, at the end, which does not employ, it's just waste. And so all people believe that the government expenditure is waste. They disregard the inequ in inequity effect of government. You know, that uh, when you say this to the classical macroeconomist, he says that's a political role to redistribute the income from the rich to the poor. We shouldn't get involved in this. The reason why he says so is that the mathematics involved in doing a model where there are two income classes is so complicated that the idiots who only know linear algebra, you know, they can't do it. And consequently, one started 50 years ago when one started with the mathematization of classical macro going down the linear equilibrium thinking instead of the dynamic one. So this was an equally uh, mixing a lot of metaphor answers to what I felt you said. Thank you for asking the question, uh, and uh, I gave an answer.
Okay, do you have another question there in the middle? Yes? <laughs> So, Randall, what do you think about uh, the effect of uh, CO2, CO2 emission certificates um, as a way to finance the transition? Would that not be an easier case instead of increasing the income tax? No. <laughs> <laughs> the reason is that we have tried. Okay, so in 1990, when the first people understood what we're talking about here, they gave the totally rational macroeconomist answer. So why don't we tax coal at the coal face, oil at the, the oil well, and gas at the well? So we just put a tax to pay for the negative externalities of oil, coal, and gas. The Americans said absolutely no. You know, for what reason? For the obvious reason that in America, you know, taxes are negative. This is the land of the free. You know, we don't want this. Then the Europeans, with our, our current Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, was at that point in time in the Ministry of Finance in Norway. He and his friends were the guys who invented the market, simply to come up with uh, an alternative ID that was not a tax, so that one could then, you know, get the Americans to support it, and they succeeded. And this is now 30 years ago, and we've been working hard to get this system to work uh, for 30 years, and it hasn't. Now we're finally getting to the point where the EU has agreed on plugging most of the gaping holes in the system so that the carbon price is probably going to rise, you know, much to, to significant levels, you know, now, you know, the, or during the next five years. My worry about this is that once it starts to bite, democratic society is going to say we don't want this. You know, we can't afford, our businesses will go broke, you know, and I cannot pay my gas bill. So we need to get rid of the, the CO2 price. Uh, but yes, in principle, it could work. It has turned out to be very difficult to get it to, to work. In my mind, it is much easier to ban fossil cars than it is to get a CO2 price which exceeds roughly $150, which is what you do need in order to make an electric car competitive with a fossil car. Uh, so here you have all my biases. Uh, and, and then in the end, I do think that the absolutely simplest way of doing something, if you are interested, is to subsidize what you want rather than not doing so. And I'm eager after the, the talk to understand what you think Extra uh, and the IFO guy actually said so that I can give you a decent uh, answer to the question. You didn't get one, so we will do that afterwards. But the, that's a, I had the same question that for me, uh, during the whole day is uh, will we now switch to subsidies, subsidy everything, uh, and is that really the solution or one part of the solution? And Mr. Fayo asked the same question <laughs> that he had a little bit of bad feeling about only talking subsidies, and then you nevertheless said that you find it right to talk about CO2 uh, taxation beside your other solution. You are not against. So it is CO2 tax, or are you? So, she would do a good job as a journalist who asks the question that if you answer yes, it's wrong, and if you answer no, it's wrong. So let me answer with a, a different way. I think carbon market is displacement. What do I mean by displacement? It's something that you can manage to agree on when the real problem is so big that you don't like it. And let me give you another example which irritates me even more. And that is the recent focus on plastic in the ocean. 
you know, that's something that gathers broad support on the whole right wing of society, you know, from the extreme right all the way into the middle and even some part of the left side, because here is something where one feels one can do something because one can blame the poor countries for emitting most of the plastic, and then one can talk about the fact that we're funding ships that are trying to take this thing up. Plastic in the ocean is totally unimportant compared to stop using coal, oil, and gas. You know, this is a tiny, little, unimportant way in which humanity is destroying the environment. We're destroying the environment in, you know, hundreds of times as important by burning coal, oil, and gas. And then people start spending time on making international associations for the removal of plastics from the ocean. So, and my feeling is that the, 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 the EU, the ETS, the European Trading System, is exactly the same type of thing. There you occupy a large number of technocrats you know, and a lot of political debate, you know, on something which is not going to work. But yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> we have better discussions. The other point, I just want to say it. I asked Jürgen, please, can't you talk about, can you talk about public transport and not only about electric cars? We are engaging ourselves for public transport and we don't think that electric cars are solutions. <laughs> because of all the resources, biodiversity, and I couldn't convince you to talk about public transport because. So, since I know I've been given the warning, I can happily I can talk about anything. Of course, <laughs> uh, no. But the, the point is the following: uh, that uh, public transport and trains, you know, are very useful in very high density societies. So the idea of transporting people living in a two million uh, inhabitant city to work using a subway or the tram instead of using the private car, of course, makes endless sense. And it also makes sense even if the cars are pollution free and noise free, namely electric. What does not make sense is what you know, our friends in the ecological movement in Norway are pushing for. So these guys want high-speed trains from Oslo to Bergen, which is the only, which is, uh, how many kilometers? This is 500 kilometers, and it's mountains like this. And the CO2 emissions that you generate by drilling the hole, you know, from Oslo to here is more than 100 years of the emissions from the cars that are running. So this is totally ridiculous, particularly when you then know that all cars in Norway are going to be electric from 2035. Then there are no emissions from, from electric cars. So I am against you know, huge infrastructure uh, investments that are there in order to reduce emissions from fossil cars because fossil cars will be history before we get those projects completed. I think the person from the audience will ask you the question about resources. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Johanna? Uh, I have two questions. First of all, uh, you mentioned this in passing, but you do think that we will be moving towards a more deglobalized world in the future? Yes. Okay. And uh, the second one, in, as far as I've understood, in both your graphs, the good one and the bad one, uh, GDP per person continues to go up, right? Uh, how will this happen first if there will be less and less fossil resources? And second, how will this happen if global warming continues to happen and affects agriculture negatively? Fabulous question. That's a very good question, and now we should tape the answer I'm able to come up with. <laughs> because now 
we really need to know what GDP is. So the GDP is the value of the annual production of goods and services. So it is the volume of goods and services, the number of goods and the number of services we produce in a year multiplied with the market price. So this is something which is measured in dollars per year. The ecological footprint that is associated with this GDP is something we measure in tons per year. It is the tons of raw materials that you use per year to do this activity, and it's the emissions in tons per year from this thing. What I believe in, and what I have been fighting for for 50 years, is to reduce the ecological footprint. It is to reduce resource use measured in tons and emission measured in tons. Because this is what damages the world. Whether, you know, when the, G -G when the GDP is growing in your society and our stinking rich society, it's the value of the services that we exchange that is increasing. It has no impact on the ecological footprint, hardly. You know, the way in which I make money, you know, I give very expensive talks. In reality, this means that the artist who is painting the very nice pictures that I buy for my high honoraria, you know, that's so what is going on in reality. I speak better and better more and more eloquent, convincing more and more people. He paints pictures that are valued at ever higher value. So we are doing a deal, and that deal increases the GDP. The footprint effect of that thing is very close to zero. And if the people who want to confuse you know, the footprint with the GDP had once started to look at what this means in very rich societies, you know, they would have understood that what they should be concerned about is the footprint measured in tons. They, whatever, you know, what the GDP will be doesn't uh, matter much. Let me give you one concrete answer. So if I succeed in shifting the workers from the mine and from the construction of the coal thing into building windmills and solar panels. What do you think is the effect on the number of jobs? No, oh, no. You know, the total employment is the same independent of what they do. Then you can ask the question, what's the effect on the GDP? Because the GDP is, of course, the value of the coal mine, you know, or the amount of coal power that they can produce per year. And, and, and in this end, the GDP is the value of the solar energy that is being produced. So if they produce the same amount of energy, the effect on the GDP will be none. If they produce a little less because the labor productivity is lower in windmills, which it is because it is not profitable, you know, yes, then the GDP will go down when you shift people from producing dirt to producing clean. But that's a tiny shift. But if you're interested, like Blanche is, you know, in reducing the GDP because she thinks this is ideologically sound, that many people would like this, they confuse cause and effect. You know, one of the things that you should be in favor of is my solution. You should move people from productive jobs into jobs that produce amenities for the large majority. This will actually lead to a reduction in, in the GDP. And so in my scenario here, where the model actually keeps track of these things,
the re if we had not shifted people in the solutions run from dirt to green, the GDP curve would have gone up even faster. But of course, people, when they live in a life, they don't know what the GDP would have otherwise been, so they are happy with the salary that they do receive. Sorry, was, 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 was this, I mean, I hope someone, I mean, and the important thing is to understand the difference between the ecological footprint, which is the resource use and the emissions generated by a certain activity, and it's measured in tons per year, it is the physical impact, and GDP, which is an economic construct. It's one way of measuring the activity level, the output of the economy. In poor societies, the two tend to follow suit. Once you pass roughly $15,000 per year, that's where China is now, the two start to deviate. You know, the, the dollar value increases much, much faster than the, the resource use, and when you get to US level in the year 1990. From then on, electricity production in the United States has been stable for the last 30 years, in spite of the population going up from 200 to 300 million people, and in spite of the income increase in, in that period of time. In my stinking rich country of Norway, where each average Norwegian uses roughly 10 times as much electricity as you do in this country, the, energy, the electricity use per household has gone down over the last 15 years and is going to continue to go down during the next 30 years. Why? Because people now have electric cars that need charging. So this increases the energy use. But the main reason is that we are now shifting all our bulbs, you know, from all incandescent uh, bulbs to the light emitting diodes. And much more important, we're changing the heating of the whole nation from panel. So we have been heating the country with electricity. Now we're running this electricity through heat pumps, your air conditioners, which gives five kilowatt hours of heat for every kilowatt hour of electricity that you put in. That's a five doubling of the benefit, the well-being, you know, from one kilowatt hour of electricity. So, the question thing. is if decoupling is enough, but a uh, question from the audience. There was uh, someone in the middle of the... Yes, I have one. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, how do you consider the impact of the raw materials, for example, for electric cars? The raw materials have a negative impact. Uh, so, indeed, when you use the electric car, it might be green, but if you produce it, it might not. So, how do you consider this in your analysis? So, here I. So, this is one of the areas in the Earth for All study where the authors fiercely disagree. My view is that we are not going to run out of any resource because. The simple reason that if you double the real cost of most resources, you can double the access. You know, the reason why we do not have a lot of lithium is that, you know, up till 20, around 20 years ago, of course, liberalism, you know, encouraged, you know, the, the failure of the most expensive or the uh, uh, producer and then gradually, you know, only the cheapest sources of lithium was left. And when we got to roughly 2010, it was the scare, you know. Uh, so the American president told, this is a joke, but it's very close to the reality. So the president, I think it was, uh, what is his fame? The younger God. Not Obama, but the, the guy before Obama. So he asks the guy, so uh, I hear, he says, that all the lithium in the world comes from China. Is that true? And his advisor says, yes, this is true. And he says, isn't this dangerous? And the advisor says, yes. 
So what is his name? The, the John the Bush. Yeah. So this is Bush, the yeah, younger, the you know, the more enthusiastic guy. So he's, <laughs> you know, do we, do, shouldn't we do something about this? Or so, no, so he says, so why, are, why is all the lithium in China? And uh, the advisor says, this is of course because of competition. You know, that's the, this is the cheapest source of lithium, and we have closed down all the U.S. Uh, mines that produce lithium. And Bush says, hmm, is that a good idea? And <laughs> that was the answer, just like someone else says, well, if you want a competitive society which doesn't screw the uh, consumer and doesn't have a strong government, this is what you get. And so for a long while, that is what they accepted. Then, unbelievably, Trump came along, and he was not as indoctrinated as Bush was, you know, in the advantage of capitalism and unfettered markets. So he started saying, isn't this a really bad idea? You know, and shouldn't we get, make America great again? And, you know, get the lithium back so we control the lithium. And he actually did. And so now the situation is that they have quite a significant production, but what happened in between was that Australia, this other country, which is, you know, the real die-hard liberal market, you know, full competition country, discovered that, Jesus Christ, we have a lot of lithium. So the current production of lithium is what would I say, at least 10 times as big as it was in 2000. And now 60% of this comes from Australia. So this doesn't worry the Americans so badly. They formed the, the you know, the still have, what's that, Pacific Ocean Rim cooperative arrangement, you know, which makes the American feel that they can get the lithium from Australia. So my main point is the following. If you're worried about anything, please go and check your details. Find out where the thing comes from at this point in time. Where did it come from 10 years ago and where did it come 20 years ago? And you will see that the era of liberalization, of the globalization, of the long supply lines, you know, gradually just eliminated all the slightly more costly producers. So we ended up being dependent on a few places. That can be easily reversed if you subsidize. So you just subsidize the thing and you get all the resources you need. I must then, and sorry for being ironic, but I do this in order to try to entertain. Um, uh, I must admit that my dear friend Anders Wickman, who is one of the central people in our project. He is the chair of the International Resource Panel. He is in fierce disagreement with me on this. He thinks that we're going to run out of resources. I, there's no way I think that we're going to run out of resources. And I also, in order to make life difficult for my dear friend and others, make the point that, do you remember the 1980s when you guys thought that we were going to run out of coal, oil, and gas? Do you remember the peak oil movement, you know, which was the movement that was trying to tell when we run out of oil, you know, so that we will start, etc. We did not run out if of oil. If you talk worldwide equity, Jürgen, yes. do you really think that all the people on this planet could afford uh, any time uh, all an electric car and that we would protect biodiversity at the same time and that we, yes, yes. everything is fine, you think so? Yes, I think so, but it will take time. You know, there is no way in which we can move the world, so the world average GDP per person today is 15,000. Your GDP is 75,000. You're roughly five times as, as rich as uh, the rest of the world. If you moved the current seven, eight billion people in one go from the $15,000 they currently have to the $75,000 that you have, 
this would be a resource shock of the order of a factor of three or four, something like this is what would happen, and that would cause difficulties. But this is not what is going to happen. What will happen is that the GDP per person is going to grow very slowly at roughly 3% a year, you know, over the next 100 years, the blue line that I indicated to you. Meanwhile, the world population is going to peak and the total population is going to go down again to roughly 6 billion people. So the world in which everyone has an electric car is a world that is very much smaller than mine. So and you are not, uh, the younger people of climate change do say system change. You don't agree. Yes, I know. And I am saying... Systems change is what I've been fighting for all my life. It doesn't work. You know, there is no way you're going to get uh, the ordinary voter to be in favor of those things that needs to be done. So I am now starting to make the thing a little simpler. You know, so if people were willing to subsidize the shift of those people that produce most of the ill into producing clean and green, that solves the problem, as long as you're willing to tax the rich. And I agree that many people are not willing to tax the rich. Okay, the was like Frau Oma, I would have to Donau, on the road, sorry, I have seen so good clock, they see really, the lights are very strong, so I don't see any faces, but I see there's a question, afterwards a woman <laughs> raising her hand, and afterwards a woman at the left, and then the man at the left. Um. And the people standing up now are the people of Movement Politique, we're looking after for drinking. If you have no, finished. but should, shouldn't you allow people to leave? You know, they, okay, ask the question. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Redmond, for the simulation. So I'm very um, surprised that social unrest will be uh, the, the, the highest risk in the short run for our colleagues. So my question is, how did you define in models the social tension dimension? <laughs> did you also model it nationally or only internationally? So I can think of nations that have a bigger shift to take, for example, oil and gas dependent on OPEC. Those, those, those countries do need to shift way more. That's why my question is also regarding uh, national level, how, how, how easy it will be to uh, thank you for that answer, uh, because it allows me to say one thing which I forgot to say. The model is, of course, exceedingly imprecise. You know, the ability to say something with great precision about the future is very limited. So this is, should be thought of essentially as a consistent tool, you know, a way to try to not forget you know, that the population is developing faster if there is more food and slower if there is less food and things like this. Uh, the extent to which we model social collapse, uh, there was one of the slides that I didn't show, but it is uh, at, the, at the back of the pack, if the pack is made uh, available, is essentially one that says that if well-being is going down, then social tensions in society rise. When tension rises, the time delay for governmental action to improve the problem that irritates the people increases, which means that the societal reaction solution comes in place a little too late. And so people have gotten even more irritated and the tensions go even higher, which makes it even more difficult for the government. So that's the vicious cycle that we call a social collapse. If you then want to apply this to anything, to a region, to uh, Europe, to the world, you need to look at what is it that irritates people? You know, what is it that actually, you know, is felt to become worse. And you can just go to your neighboring France and you start understanding that such a ridiculous thing as increasing the pension age from 62 to 67 is enough to cause a social collapse in, in France.
you know so it's uh, so you just need, need to find you know what is the real problem in any nation and then you have to start to assess uh, uh, the ability of this thing to actually s disrupt societal functioning and if you find an area where there is something which is behaving according to this dynamic you should watch out and you should tell people that you ought to do something about this disintegration okay let's bring this christina christina yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. I thought there were a lot of thought-provoking uh, elements and I would have tons of questions and remarks. But I would focus on something that is worrying me a lot and that we haven't discussed at all tonight. Um, I'm very concerned about climate change and about poverty, but I'm also very concerned about the lack of human rights, uh, about the political prisoners, the lack of freedom of speech, journalists being killed, and last but not least, because that goes with it, corrupt elites. Um, you said that at some point, Western, some Western democracies, if I understood you correctly, um, decided um, to favor democracy over progress. Now, what I am really wondering is, can we really, do you think we can achieve and move towards sustainability without having strong human rights in this world and more control of corrupt political and economic elites, having more democracy? I think certain nations on the surface of the earth can make progress even if there exist other areas of the world where these rights are trampled. So I think my answer is not as black and white as you would have wanted to, you know. Uh, so uh, uh, then you could ask the question, would it be possible to take a nation which has a corrupt government <laughs> and is violating human rights and make this into a sustainable society? And I think the answer is no. You know, because it isn't sustainable when you have to suppress uh, uh, opinion uh, for a very long period of time. It, it, on the other hand, you know it, it can easily survive for 30 years or 60 years, you know, a system like that, but I don't think it is not doable genuinely. Then you could ask the question, which is perhaps more interesting, would it be possible for a 4,000-year-old Confucius-based nation like China, which is organized along a vertical thinking, where little sister, little brother, reports to little sister, reports to mother, reports to father, reports to city, uh, village elder, reports to the county, reports, etc., to the uh, emperor, to God. So Confucius is an way of organizing society where you do it vertically and this is what the Chinese have done for 4,000 years with great success except when the Brits pressed opium onto them for 150 years. Christianity has this interesting idea that you should organize society in a horizontal manner. So that's a 2,000 year old idea that everyone is equal and there should be no pecking order and everyone are equally important and equal in the decision making. These are two ways of organizing society. Both of them work. There is no need from the Chinese point of view to press the vertical uh, organization onto the rest of the world. There seems to be in certain circles an intense wish you know, to press the horizontal solution on to the Chinese. Uh, I think that if we continue trying to press the horizontal solution onto the Chinese, we will not succeed because the Chinese themselves are incredibly happy with their cultural inheritance and their newfound wealth. Uh, but not it, all of them, that's what Christiana wants to say. But uh, Christiana. Okay. Christina, Christina. Christina. Fine. This is true. But then we're, 
the fraction. So what does the United States of America do in order to keep peace and quiet in the United States of America? They have 1% of the young black people in jail. 1%. What do the Chinese do in order to try to keep peace and quiet in the fringes of the empire, which is not dominated by Han Chinese that support my ID? They put them in uh, uh, education camps, and that amounts to a million or two out of 1,350 million people. So they put 0.1% in, in, in education camps. So that's my comparison between how the vertical system currently behaves, handles dissent, and how the horizontal, the leading horizontal culture handles it dissent. Uh, the, your ideal solution is one where you do not handle dissent. Then you get to the Swedish case where one person, by burning the Quran, you know, is now prohibiting 10 million Swedes from entering NATO. And then you can start asking, is this rational? You know, that one expression of extreme uh, you know, independence, should that be allowed, you know, when it hurts 10 million people in such a direct manner? Of course, Swedish laws, Swedish parliament, Swedish police, Swedish Supreme Court all says yes. You know, it is the right of this idiot in my mind, you know, to burn the Quran. But I think, I think a society can exist and could exist sustainably, which removes that type of extreme uh, right to express your will. Again, I should stress the fact that people disagree with me on this. These are personal opinions. These are, of course, very political ones. But having lived in many nations and cultures and seen things, and luckily being an elite all the time, so I don't ex you know, being suppressed or, or something by others. This is how I end up as 77, uh, believing in this issue. So uh, what I am trying to happen in the area that interests you, namely climate change, I'm trying to modify democracy in our countries in the following way. So I would like there to be a Supreme Court on climate justice in Norway. And the Supreme Court should have veto powers over parliamentary decisions that increase climate emissions from Norwegian territory. How would we appoint people to this ex uh, ex uh, Supreme Court? So parliament, when parliament gets together, 165 people in Norway, they would elect, you know, 10 people who would be appointed for life, you know, to the, uh, the thing, or at least paid for life, so that you could, uh, so they would not be biased, and they would be uh, overruling uh, the parliament whenever the parliament passes legislation that actually increases emissions of greenhouse gases. So this is a concrete and very simple way of trying to introduce some more hierarchy in the very flat democracies of, of Scandinavian countries. Am I being listened to? Absolutely no. You know, I'm a, uh, your friends in Norway, you know, hate me for this. So. But, um you insist that uh, our team is uh, climate uh, change, climate protection, but uh, we are convinced that climate protection and human rights go together. I, okay. I, I don't see splitting, and just to, uh, that there is no uh, confusion. You don't defend the violations of human rights in China. You just say we shouldn't see ourselves as the best and only model how a country can function. You don't defend human rights violations. Oh, of course I don't. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so why don't you ask the key? Do I think that one should take 
the Quran out of the hand of the person who tries to burn it publicly? And I say, yes. I think the police should be sent and take the Quran away from him. I know that that's violating the human rights of that person, but I am not that staunch a defender of the rights. So there is, a, there, there is a limit. Okay, okay is the woman um, sitting there? But shouldn't you give this? I think we will take two, two or three questions and then we'll finish. I see that uh, you, you, you get tired asking. No, I don't get tired. But, you don't get tired. But, I mean, I, I am a professional speaker. You yeah. don't hold an audience for three hours. You know, that's, uh, that's sin. Okay. Yes. So please leave the ones that want to leave. That's the important thing. <laughs> I'm very happy. So we want to drink something together. We have so no. much to discuss. Yeah. As you just told to everyone, I'm a woman and probably well educated, uh, and I don't like children yet. So I achieve the goal that you deserve for women. Yes. Thank you for reducing uh, women to that part of the I don't know uh, yeah. of the goal that you deserve to all of us, knowing that uh, structural, social structural change are also coming for women, especially in agriculture, for example, and those kind of things. But my question is not related to that, it's more related to, um, for now, we, the, the, the renewable energy that we have uh, come in addition to all the litters that we need to fuse fossil uh, energy that we need. So is it really rea realistic to think that we will be capable of switching uh, without any degrowth, without any reduction of the way we are living or using energy? We will, so the per capita use of energy stagnates when people get rich enough. And that's the only thing which is going to stop the consumption of energy in addition to energy efficiency and those other things I spoke about. Uh, I agree with you that I do not think that normal societies, normal democratic societies, will be imposing this type of limitations on themselves. I strongly wish that they would, and that's of course what I'm trying to achieve. But I, the experience from the last 50 years is that people are not interested in doing these things. Uh, and uh, so what I'm currently doing is to try to find ways to cheat the people, you know, to, to in a way get these things to happen in a manner which doesn't seem to cost. And so that's my honest answer to this one. I'm, it's not a joke when I say I'm a deeply depressed person with a smiling face. You know, I basically gave up the first time in 1980. I really gave up in 2009 and wrote a long book about this. Now I'm back again in the circus because I do think that there are some new things we haven't tried. But basically, I think that liberal you know, society is incapable. And market-driven, profit-driven societies are incapable or imposing on themselves those few and simple things that needs to be done in order to save the world.